So first, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to, to come to the program and to speak here. I'm looking forward to, to the other talks and, and to interact with some of you during, during the time I'm here. Uh, I want to talk about joint work with Aaron Harrow, and it's based on this paper, uh, which is on the archive. Uh, and it'll be about uh, you know, uh, quantum probabilistic checkable proofs, and I'll explain what, what they are, and, uh, and about putting limitations on, on, what, on what we think it's possible to do. And, uh, so please stop me at any point if you have any question. Uh, if I'm going too, too fast, slow me down. And if I'm too slow, just tell me I'm very slow. Uh, so I just want to start very slowly, just remind you what constraint satisfaction problems are and how we can uh, define a quantum generalization of them. So they are very simple, so I will put some parameters here. Uh, so a constraint satisfaction problem depends on, on four parameters. One is the arity. So it is basically a constraint satisfaction problem. It's just a, a number of variables, like the axis here, and some constraints on these variables. And this constraint should only act on a few of the variables, each one of them. So k is the number of variables that each constraint acts on. For example, here, three in the picture. Then another parameter is the alphabet. Is how many you know, is 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 the space over which the variables can vary. So, for example, binary uh, alphabet means that x can be either zero or one, and so on. Then we have the number of variables n is just the number of x's here, uh, and we have the number of constraints, just the number of c's. So the constraint is just in the simplest case that we want to consider here is just a function from from the space of uh, from the k-fold space of the alphabet to zero or one. So you can think the constraint is satisfied if it's Zero is violated if it's one. And now we like to put some assignment on these variables, assign uh, values to these variables, such that we satisfy the maximum number of constraints possible. So the assignment is just some function from, from the set of variables here. right? So we have n variables. And to each variable, we put one of the values in the alphabet. And now what's interesting seeing here is how many of these constraints we can satisfy. right? So maybe we can satisfy all of them. Great. But maybe we can only satisfy a, a certain number of them. And we want to find the assignment which satisfies the maximum number of constraints. Right? So this is the formula. So we can define what we call unsat value of the constraint satisfaction problem C. And then we just minimize over all possible assignments. And this is the average number of constraints being uh, violated. Right? So this is between 0 and 1. If it's 0, all the constraints are satisfied. If it's 1, all of them are violated. And we, wanna, we, we might want to compute this. All right, so quantum constraint satisfaction problems, we, we just do almost the same thing, but we generalize a little bit in our definition of, of these local constraints. So, so now we, okay, let's call it H, because we we'll connect some Hamiltonian later, as we saw in Daniel's talk. Here we have the arity again, which we call this locality as well, is how many, uh, how many of the variables uh, each constraint depends on. Now instead of alphabet, we have some local dimension. We have, again, now number of variables is just their qubits or qubits, right? It is bigger than two. And we have the number of constraints as well. Now, the only difference is that the constraints now, instead of being these functions, they are, in the most simplest case, projections, OK? And, and k-local projections. So they are projection, uh, projector, uh, projector matrix, which only acts non-trivially in at most k of the, of the qubits, OK? I'll give you an example in the next slide, if it's not clear. Now, because we, ha we, are, we are in this no-commuting problem, right? we have this projector instead of this function, the assignment is not just some, some big string for the variables, but now it's a quantum state, psi. And, we, and the unsat now is really the quantum state which violates the most number of constraints. And here, how we define, right? We want to minimize over all quantum states this average violation. So we have m constraints. We divide by the number of constraints. And we see this expectation value, uh, and the sum of each one of these local constraints, pj. Right, so this is like the probability of measuring like zero, namely pj, when we are in the quantum state of psi. Right, and there is a better way of writing this. Right, this is just we minimize over states. This is just a minimal eigenvalue. This is a emission matrix. So it, we can also write this in terms of one over m times the minimal eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So two examples, just if you never saw this, uh, to make it clear. Suppose we have a constraint satisfaction problem, a quantum one on uh, the locality is two. So each, each of these constraints 
only depends on two of the qubits, then uh, the alphabet is two, so it's like qubits, right? So two dimensional quantum systems on n particles, and we have n minus one constraints. So it's, we are on a line, for example, here. Then we just have some constraint satisfaction problem. It's just, we call quantum Hamiltonian. It's the sum of these local terms. And what I mean by local terms is the terms have this form. So for example, the term j and j plus one, it's trivial everywhere. It's identity everywhere, except on qubits j and j plus one. And there is just any projection we want to put. I'm focused on projectors for simplicity. You could consider any Hermitian matrix if you want, but uh, let's, let's focus on projectors in this talk. So this is one example, right? Another example that shows that these quantum constraint satisfaction problems are generalization of the classical one is just to see what happens if, again, we have uh, locality 2 right on qubits, n and m, and variables m constraints, but now we have diagonal projectors. And let, let's put the projects of this form, right? So they are just these classical constraints from before, and now some basis, the computational basis. Oh, uh, right. And now if you, you can compute this ansatz, right, it's this minimum eigenvalue, then because this, this is diagonal in the computational basis, the optimal states will be diagonal in the computational basis. And you can do the calculation, you see this is equal to the minimum over all assignments to this quantity. And if you just put the definition of BJ, you see that this is exactly the answer of the classical problem. Okay, so, so if you wanna just forget about quantum mechanics and everything, you can just think of this as some natural generalization of constraint satisfaction problems, right? Uh, all right, so, so the main result about constraint satisfaction problems that uh, I want to consider in this talk is the PCP theorem. I'm sure many of you have heard of it before. Uh, so it's a result by many people, including the chair. Uh, so first proved in 98. And, and the statement is the following. It, uh, they showed that there is some universal <coughs> constant, epsilon, such that it's NP hard to determine whether for a given constraint satisfaction problem, the unsat is zero, so you, you have a satisfiable assignment, or the unsat is bigger than epsilon, okay? So, so why this is very interesting and, and very strong result? Because if you just look at cook levin theorem, right, that's to see whether a constraint satisfaction problem is satisfiable or not, uh, one way to, to formulate as a decision problem is to tell whether the unsat is zero or the unsat is bigger than one over m, the number of constraints. Here the unsat is a constant, right? So Either they are, all the constraints are satisfied, or a constant fraction of them is not satisfied. All right, and even this very, in, at first sight, very easy problem, it's still quite hard, right? It's NP hard, okay? So the name comes from, from the fact that, you know, using these results, you can find a new way of writing proofs for, for NP problems, as in terms of probabilistic checkable proofs. I won't get into that. Yeah, Daniel already mentioned in the talk. So uh, later, like nine years later, uh, Dinu came up with a more combinatorial proof of the same results, and we will touch on this proof a little bit later. Uh, and it's first a very beautiful result, but it's also very useful, right? So it's really the central tool when you want to do hardness of approximation, right? So when you want to find the limits of how well you can approximate uh, like many combinatorial optimization problems, uh, the PCP is, is really the starting point. Right, so, so given this, and uh, given that we have this quantum version of constraint satisfaction problems, it's, it's natural to ask whether there is a version of this result, right? But to ask this, first we have to see if there is a notion of, of NP hardness in the quantum case. Right? Uh, and there is one, right? And, and Daniel already explained. So this is like the quantum cook levin theorem. Uh, and one formulation of it due to Kitaev is using this local Hamiltonian problem. So here we have again a, a quantum constraint satisfaction problem, locality k, local dimension d. Uh, and then we have locality and, and local dimension are constant. The number of constraints in, is polynomial in the number of, of qubits. And the, the goal of the problem is to decide if the ansatz is zero or if it's bigger than delta, okay, for some, some fixed delta. So what Kitai has proved is that this problem is complete for a class, but now a quantum class called QMA, uh, when this delta is sufficiently small, like one over polynomially in N. Uh, so this QMA is just, we saw before, is just the quantum analog of NP, right? It's exactly like NP, but the input is a quantum, st is, uh, sorry, the proof is a quantum state, 
uh, and the verification procedure is a quantum computation. It's polynomial quantum computation. All right, so, uh, so this, this is an interesting result, first, because it's a very natural problem, right? Hamiltonians, they are important in physics as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually, it shows that this problem, this quantum Hamiltonian problem, it's actually harder than the classical one, right? So if we believe that QMA is not equal to NP, that we cannot prove it, but we believe it's the case, then actually to solve this problem, the quantum case requires, is much harder than solving for, for, classical, for classical Hamiltonians. All right, so, so what, what's the quantum PCP conjecture? So what, what we want to do is to state something which is similar to, to the classical PCP, but now for QMA, okay? And we cannot prove if it's true or not. It's an open question. Uh, but at least we can state a possible conjecture, right? So, so one way to, to state this conjecture would be to say that, again, there is some universal constant such that the following problem is QMA complete. So given a constraint satisfaction problem, quantum, locality 2 and local dimension 2, for example, we want to determine whether it's satisfiable, so the unsat is 0, or whether uh, the unsat value is bigger than epsilon. Okay, so the same thing as, as for the classical one. So of course we can change the locality and the local dimension, right, to like any, any constant you want. This doesn't change the conjecture, so it was proven that the conjecture is equivalent to this more general case. Uh, we know this is NP hard, this problem, right, by the classical PCP theorem. Uh, we also know this is inside QMA, uh, because even when the unsat is, is like one over, one over poly polynomial n, it's inside QMA. So the question is where it sits in between, right? It's equal to actually this is inside NP or it's actually QMA hat. The conjecture says it's QMA hat. Can it be a constant or can it be super constant also? So uh, one formulation is when they are constant, but it would be very interesting if you can prove versions even when. But their proof is the equivalence. Oh, oh the equivalence. Constant then. Maybe log, log, log. So it's, I, I don't remember, but uh, I think log wouldn't be enough, but log, log might be. Or then it already works. I think it was worse than exponential, how the price you pay from converting. But I, I don't remember exactly. And, and to show how much we don't understand this problem, even for commuting, quantum constraint satisfaction problems, we put all these constraints to commute, right? Doesn't mean that they are di diagonal in, a, in the computational base, they only commute. It could be that, you know, we don't know if it's true or not. It could be that it's QMA hard, it could be that it's in NP. All right, so. So why we're interested in, in this problem? I, I won't say much, but I just want to say a few things. First, I feel it would be nice to have you know, some hardness of approximation result for QMA. This, right, this would give that. Um, in terms of <laughs> physics, right, it would give, uh, show quantum hardness of computing mean uh, ground energy. Mean, I mean like the, the energy per interaction term, right, instead of the total energy. And because we think QMA is not equal to NP, this shows that there will be no good ansatz for some particular models, not only for the ground states, but really for any low energy states, right? Even when you go to some constant fraction of the total energy, th these states, they are extremely complicated, right? Very entangled, for example. One caveat is that for, as for the classical PCP, a quantum PCP, we will need some kind of expanded graph. It's not very physical, but you know, it still will be interesting, I think. So maybe once we could prove some quantum PCP, this would be some sophisticated form of quantum error correction, right? The classical PCP involves a lot of nice ideas in, in error correction. Maybe the same would be true here. Who knows? Uh, and, and really, I don't want to say much about this. So you can check a recent review paper by uh, Dorit Sitai and, and Thomas. Very nice, motivate the problem. And also Thomas gave a talk here on the first week about quantum PCP motivations and what's known. So you can watch online. All right, so, so before I get to, to the actual content of the talk, which is try to give some limitations for, this, for these objects, let me just mention a little bit of the history of the problem. I think the first paper that mentioned this problem was a paper by, by uh, Doritz and, and, and Nave in 2002, which was an explanation of this uh, Kitaev's quantum cook levin theorem. They just say, oh, well, maybe, you know, there is a quantum version of PCP. So I guess already from from the beginning of quantum NP-hardness theory, this problem has been around. Then the first 
uh, then after this, I, I guess no one looked into the problem. Then the next uh, result, well, the next time I, I saw this mention, it was actually in the, in the blog post by Scott. So he called the Quantum PCP Manifesto. So it was how I learned about this problem. Uh, and, and I just want to show some parts, if, with his permission, of what he writes, because it's, it's interesting. So he wrote, I'm 99% sure this theorem, conjecture, or something close to it is true. Good. 95 sure that it requires difficult adaptation of classical PCP, where the Eurician or Puritian, in much the same way as quantum fault tolerance requires difficult adaptation of classical fault tolerance. I'm 85% sure that the proof is achievable in a year or so, should and <laughs> enough people make it priority. I'm 75 sure that the proof once achieved will open up here for undreamed visas of understanding and insights, and I'm 0.01% sure I can yeah. prove it. And that's why I hereby bequeath the actual proving part to you, my readers. Okay. I completely forgot that <laughs> So we have, well, how how we would update them? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So you know. So this showed that there was yeah. right. It, it looks like yeah. new ideas were needed, but uh, maybe I think they I'd rather all of them, including the last one. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you know. It's a, it's a very nice, also the uh, the comments are nice, they're a nice discussion. And one of the comments by Scott is saying that we will see later this, say I'm quite certain quantum PCP theorem will require significant new ideas. Recently I spent a day or two studying Irrit's proof of the classical PCP theorem. And I found about 20 violations of the non-cloning theorem on every page, right? So <laughs> I remember really saying what, what he means by that, I, I couldn't really understand. So uh, I guess one of the ways to see the, the result of this talk is to is to formalize this better, right? To see what, what it means to, for these classical proofs to violate non-cloning and, and to be very difficult to quantize. So, uh, but I'll get there. All right, so I, I guess some people took up the challenge of, of right, trying to find quantum PCP. Then the first results uh, by these guys, uh, Dorit, Tai, uh, Zeth, and, and Umesh, uh, they start trying to study if you can quantize uh, uh, Zinu's proof of the PCP. Well, I mean, not quantizing Dino herself, but <laughs> the proof, her proof. <laughs> and so, so they, they had some partial success. They could quantize version of gap amplification by random walk on expanders, but not when you, uh, not when you pay a, a large price blowing up the, uh, the alphabets, but when you blow up the locality, you blow up the areas. And then there is a quantum version of this. But they also notice that you, you get stuck in trying to get to get the other parts to work, right? It's it's a hard problem. Then there was another direction of trying to disprove the conjecture. And, and there are several results I just mentioned very briefly. So so Itayarad proved that it's shows some NP approximation for two local quantum constraint satisfaction problems when they are almost commuting. Okay? So when, when they are commuting for two local, <laughs> this is always an NP, it's a result by uh Brave and Vilai. So when they are close to commuting, you already have some non trivial approximation. So this was one result. Then there was some sequence of results. I just mentioned two by Hastings and, and Friedman. And what they propose is an is a easier conjecture, which is also interesting as it's related to quantum PCP. Uh, and, and they gave some good evidence that it's probably true. And so this is also some evidence for quantum PCP. So this conjecture they call, call no low energy <coughs> trivial states just says that you have local models, quantum constraint satisfaction problems, for which uh, if you look at all, all the low line energy states, okay, up to some constant fraction, they are all pretty complicated. So first, they are not product states. That's the first step. But second, they are not even like product states with a constant depth circuit applied to them. Okay, so they have some complicated entanglement structure. So of course, if quantum PCP is true, this conjecture is true as well, but not the opposite. So it's interesting thing to study. Um, so more recently, uh, there was a paper by uh, Doritz and, and uh, Leo Elda. So what they, what they could get is an NP approximation now for uh, K, for any K, K local commuting quantum constraint satisfaction problem on small set expanders, which, are, which have very high expansion. Okay? And they also started the study of quantum locally testable codes, which is a very useful and important thing in classical PCP. And they also found some limitations for these things. So this is a negative result for quantum PCP, right? So usually, you know, if you have a good small set expander, this is exactly the kind of graphs that you get on classical PCP. Here it's showing that maybe this is not the right 
type of graphs for quantum PCP. And the result that I, uh, I want to focus on, on the rest of this talk uh, is also in the spirits of this one, but it's, it's a little bit different, is, is approximation in NP for now uh, fixed arity, so too local, but for non-commuting quantum constraint satisfaction problems. Okay? Uh, and now because this is like a workshop on, on quantum games and protocols, I just want to phrase this, this bad news for quantum PCP in the language of protocols and games. Okay? So this is what I want to do in the next slides. Is there any question so far? What does it mean, approximation in NP? It means that uh, I will give you a classical witness that the energy is low enough. For example, product state. This would be the. All right. So, uh, to, so to formulate in terms of uh, of protocols and games, I want to consider this kind of maps, which are very common in like uh, classical complexity theory, and we and might be something else that you want to quantize. And I want to show that this together with quantum PCP doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't fit together. So what are these maps? So so this is a proposition classically. Okay, so I'll show you. I'll give an idea of the proof. It's very it's very standard. It shows that for every integer t, you can find efficient mapping from constraint satisfaction problem of like uh, locality two, so every two alphabet sigma n and m into some again locality two, but some other uh, parameters such that the number of variables and the number of clauses they blow up, but only like you know as like that. So if t is constant, it's still polynomial. The degree of the oh, we imagine now that it's it's too local, right? So there is an interaction graph. Let's imagine it's a regular graph, okay, for simplicity. So the degree blows up like exponentially, okay. The <coughs> alphabet blows up exponentially as well. Now, the ansatz can only grow up, okay. It does not decrease. And if it was satisfiable before, it's also satisfiable. Okay? So if you know parallel repetition, this is exactly what it achieves, right? I, I will show you later. So, uh, oh, so let, let's see this. So one way to do this procedure. So there is no particular reason why you're interested in this, right? There are actually it's quite useful classically, but I just you know I just want to uh, <coughs> yes. Oh, that there exists such mapping, right? For every t, there exists no, no. this mapping. What, what's Where improving in the mapping? Yeah. What's getting better? Yeah. Oh, that's the thing. Nothing, right? So, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no, 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 because because you blow up the alphabet exponential, but you also blow up the degree exponential. So there is a trade-off, right? So you increasing the degree and you increase the alphabet. There's no trade-off. But there's a trade-off for you see why? Yeah, why we care? <laughs> okay, right. It's not clear that you should care about this, but. <laughs> right, okay. So how you achieve that? Oh, okay, I wrote a lot of stuff, but it's not important because it's not. So, so the way people do classically, this is the setting of parallel repetition. Okay, so based on what you do, you have your constraint satisfaction problem. You write as a cover label instance. There is some reduction for that. Forget the details. I, I, I don't want to spend time on that. And then you do the setting of parallel repetition. Okay. And now, of course, I, I call this parallel repetition for kids because as you all complain, right? So the proposition I show achieves nothing. What's interesting about this procedure is that, as uh, Ron Ross showed, actually it amplifies the unsat value exponentially, and that's why this procedure is interesting. But if you had some other procedure that only achieves this, these six things and does not amplify the gap, it would be fine as well. We don't care. Okay, we call this this, uh, this blowing up maps. Okay, they blow up the degree and they blow up the alphabet, but both exponentially. Can you remind me what the degree was? The, I mean the oh, the, oh, yeah, because I didn't, uh, so, uh, sure. Uh, so you have a, you have an every to two constraint satisfaction problem, right? So you have the variables. And because it's every to two, the constraints, they are just, they are like, they only act on two variables. So you can define interacting, uh, interaction graph here, right? So here is one constraint, here's another one. So the degree is just the degree of this graph, okay? And we assume that it's uh, regular. All right. So, so I, I'm sorry, I'm yes, sure. a mesh, so I don't understand. Um, so why is not identity? I mean, if you are um, just adding dummy edges, like, like if it does, then it certainly... Oh, but then the unsat will go down if you just add dummy edges, right? You, the unsat value will go down, right? Oh, because you are relating it to the number of constraints. Right, yes. So just adding dummy edges will not do the job, but this setting of parallel repetition will do. 
And you don't have to prove the interesting things that the NSAT actually amplifies this, right? Yes, what if you just introducing parallel edges or you are not allowed or you don't allow that? Um, I don't want to allow that because um, I, like the quantum cases would be project, right? The local terms are always projectors. Yeah. So um, this would be, just mean you're multiplied by some constant these projectors and yeah, it's not yeah, so what you, so yeah. that would do, but, but you don't allow that. Yeah. Isn't the growth of the alphabet more the issue? But... Sorry? So the growth of the alphabet oh, of, is, of is perhaps this... not, not, the not the obvious part. Here. <coughs> The question was, why can't you just do the identity map or something? But when you grow the alphabet, you have new cases to handle. Yeah. yeah the, the grow, when you grow the alphabet, it just hurts to your advantage. No, because you can just tensor everything with the identity, and that grows the alphabet. So I think growing the degrees, but, but you have to compensate for by growing the alphabet. Is this? I, yeah. But Either way, you have to say what the CSP is going to do on these new values of the alphabet. So, well, at least classically, it does nothing because if you are like you consider three coloring, like if you add extra colors, you just say that those if 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 a node has that color, that's already doomed, then you are just not then it's just not satisfied. So. Maybe quantum like adding new alphabet letters does not devastate you. You could treat every, the, the new letters all, all like the, the letter A, and then they would have no effect on anything. If you say, like if you have ABC in the beginning, you add EF, you treat DF all as A, then nothing would change except the alphabet size. But isn't degree the most important thing? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, this, this tool is what we care, right? This tool thinks that they grow, grow exponentially. Okay, but okay, let, let me show you why, why we care about this. So now uh, the result is that suppose that we had this a quantum version of this thing that I just show you now, and suppose that we had quantum PCP as well. So the result is that uh, it, it doesn't work. Okay, one of these two has have to be false. Okay, so that's the result. So if for every t integer t there is efficient mapping from quantum constraint satisfaction problem to quantum constraint satisfaction problem with the same properties as before, right? So you blow up the degree, you blow up the, the local dimension now as a result. If it's satisfiable, it's still satisfiable, and then sats can only grow, not decrease. Then the quantum PCP conjecture has to be false, okay? Uh, so, uh, so I think w one way to interpret this result is as bad news of exactly this program of trying to quantize the classical proof of the quantum PCP, right? Because this kind of, of maps, it's something very easy to come up with classically and is actually a uh, very similar, <coughs> similar trick is what you do for proving the PCP, right? It's like this quantum gap amplification. You copy the variables around, you play with it in a much clever, more clever way than this, and then you get there. Now, even if you had this very, <coughs> a quantum version of this very uh, simple procedure, which is like maybe the starting point of, of PCP, then PCP doesn't, Quantum PCP doesn't hold true. So, uh, so this shows that if you want to find, if quantum PCP is true and you want to prove it, you must find some probably a very different way than just trying to quantize the classical proofs, right? Uh, all right, so now uh, the way, one way to prove this, right, is using this label cover. Yeah, uh, this, you can translate this into a problem about games, like to prove games, and then in this setting you, uh, you prove this kind of result and then you convert back into constraint satisfaction problems. So classically you can go from games to constraint, constraint satisfaction problems very easily. Quantum, we don't know how to do that. So apparently this, this, this kind of map is not related to repetition for quantum games. Okay? Can you go back yes. to, the, to the, your definition of repetition? Oh, this is light. This? Yeah, because I want to skip it, but sure. Yes. I, uh, okay. because I don't, but please. Do no, I thought that you were going to explain it, uh, the, the, two, the provers Version. Oh yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, right. Uh, right. So, right. So this is a good point. But right? this is all in terms of constraint satisfaction problem, and you see it's quite messy. It's much nicer to work with in terms of uh, like interactive proofs to play interactive proofs, and it's actually equivalent to this procedure. Quantum, we can of course just define some quantum version of this, but it's, we don't know if it's related to to uh, interactive proofs. Okay. 
uh, which is bad news, right? Because if you could relate, then this, maybe this would be a, easy, a, a way of disproving quantum PCP, right? But we don't know how to do that. OK. Um, all right, so, uh, so now what I want to do is just to show, show you why, 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 why this theorem is true. Um, and the way I want to do that is to connect to something very uh, interesting and fundamental about, about entanglement, quantum correlations, which is what we call entanglement monogamy. Okay? So this is the main idea behind, behind this result that, that I just showed. So we hear a lot about entanglement monogamy this week, I think. Let me just introduce you the idea just with a simple examples. So one example is suppose that we have a state, right, row between Alice and Bob, and it's a pure state entanglement, in particular like an EPR pair. Then it's an easy exercise to check that if you consider any tripartite quantum state, which has row AB as the reduction, they have to have this form, right? They have to be product with C. So the fact that A and B are very entangled implies that it has to be product with C, right? So, no, you see, and classically, of course, this doesn't happen, right? An arbitrary number of classical systems can be perfectly correlated. Quantum, this is not the case. Another interesting example is what if the entanglement is more global, right? So we have this cat state. So all, the, all, all parts A1 to AN, they are in the zero state, plus preposition all in the one state. Then this looks like, right, the entanglement monogamy is being uh, violated, right? So everyone is highly entangled with everyone else. But it's not true if you look in the right way. So here we're interested in what happens to the uh, bipartite reduced density matrix. So we look at rho for A, I, A, J, right? We trace out over all the rest. And then it's easy to see that this is a separable state, right? It's classically correlated. But there is no entanglement anymore. So, uh, so one way to think about monogamy is just in terms of cloning, okay? So this is a version. The entangled monogamy is a version of the non-cloning theorem, but for quantum states, a static version. So how, how is one way to see this connection? Uh, is to show that if you could violate monogamy, you could clone. And if you could clone, you could violate monogamy, right? So this is very simple. Let me show you. Suppose we have an EPR pair. Suppose we had a cloning machine, like here, okay? So what you can do, you can prepare an EPR pair between A and B, and you send B through the cloning machine. But now you have a tripartite state A, B1, and B2, and A is maximally entangled both with B1 and B2, right? So violation of this monogamy, right? This, by this example, we cannot happen. Uh, conversely, suppose we had violation of monogamy. So we have a state A, B1, B2, which is maximally entangled between A and B1, and is also maximally entangled between A and B2. Now what we can do is just, we do teleportation, right? So I would just put some states, psi, we use this as a resource for teleportation with their measurements. And by teleportation, we know that both B1 and B2 will get this quantum information. We'll get this state. So we have a cloning <coughs> machine. OK? So uh, but, but the advantage of working with, with entanglement monogamy is that right, we don't have to think about any, any like uh, dynamical process now. It's something about quantum states as well, only. Uh, all right. So what's, what's intuition behind this entanglement monogamy? As I already said, but one is that uh, A, if you, if you look at a multiparticle state, like here, the, and you look at the subsystem A, uh, this subsystem can only be substantially entangled with a few of the Bs, right? A cannot be very much entangled with many of the Bs, right? That's the intuition. So how entangled A can be depends on the size of A. Of course, if A is huge, it can have an EPR pair with each one of the Bs, right? But as soon as A is fixed size, then monogamy starts to kick in. Uh, and now, really, the, uh, the way to study monogamy is to try to make it quantitative, right? To understand quantitatively how this monogamy appears. There are several years of doing that, and you see during this week many of them. So I think in Patrick's talk on Thursday, you see how to study monogamy using entanglement measures. Right? It's a way of quantifying entanglement, and you can see how how they behave if you have multiparticle states like this. We can also study entangled monogamy in specific tasks and see how it manifests itself. So you can think of quantum key distribution, for example, as manifestation of entangled monogamy, right? Because A and B are maximally entangled. Eve has to be decorrelated, and therefore she doesn't know anything about measurements in the state. We will see this on MIP as well, MIP with entanglement. We have a session. We can also interpret as entangled monogamy. Uh, and the way of studying uh, entangled monogamy that I want to focus here is using what we call these quantum definitive theorems. Okay? So Aaron will also talk about them on Thursday. 
from a different point of view. Uh, uh, but I, I want to focus uh, on a particular aspect of this kind of theorems. OK, so, so what they are. So let me, let me show you the basic version of this theorem. And it's a long uh, history of work section leading to it. And then I want to show the version that works for, uh, for proving the theorem that I showed you before. So the, the first version uh, studies what happens when you have a permutation symmetric state. So imagine that we have a quantum state of n particles. Here are the particles. Okay? And it's permutation symmetric in, in the sense that if you just permute two of these systems, like here, the state doesn't change. Okay? So the state is invariant on the permutations. Then the result is that we take this state on n particles, and we consider reduced state on L. Okay, so we just look at the L first particles here. Then, for any state, doesn't matter what it was before, but it was symmetric, this will be close to a convex combination, probability distribution PK, of product states. So we rotate a local states on these subsystems. And the error goes like uh, local dimension to the square L over N. N is the total number of subsystems, right? So this first is just a complete analogy with what we know for classical probability distributions. Right? There are classical versions of DFINETI, and it tells the same. Okay? But I think it's a much more interesting result in the quantum context, because here there is no entanglement anymore. Right? There is only classical correlations here. So, so this, uh, this quantum DFINETI is really telling you something about monogamy. Right? So this is, uh, uh, there is a, lo a lot of work behind this, this final result. Uh, you can ask whether you can improve this error. By right? this error's local dimension, maybe is not good enough, and we will see. Sometimes we can improve it uh, later this week. But what I uh, what I care about is to find a more general result, okay? A more general version of these results, because we want to connect to uh, quantum constraint satisfaction problems where there is no notion of permutation invariance there. Right. I'm yes. Understanding something, but yes. if I take the cat state uh -huh. here. It's permutation symmetric. Oh yeah, and but it doesn't fall into All right. a lot of tensors. Oh, it does, but it's a good right. It's a good example, right? So, uh, so you, if you have like on n subsystem, right? These are the states, and indeed it doesn't have that form. But what you have to do, you have to trace out some of the subsystems here, right? You have to trace from k plus 1 up to the n subsystem. Ah, I, 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 I overlooked that. So you are looking at the bigger thing? This is the, 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 the yes. This thing is permutation symmetric? You look at the small the ones. The yeah. part is, is, uh, is okay. <coughs> exactly. Right. And then you see, right, you get exactly this, this classic correlated state. Yeah. Right. So. Fernando? Yes. Uh, you, you said it's somehow. Uh, Similar to monogamy of entanglement, but yes. can you say a bit more? How is it related to monogamy? I understand that entanglement is destroyed, but, but yes. Oh, because you can think that because the state is permutation symmetric, uh, everyone, each one of the particles, is equally entangled with all the others, right? And because it's equally entangled with all the others, if you just look at the the states, you know, right, of you know, for example, two of the particles, one and and two, it's a separable state. Right? Um, all right, so, so what's, what's this uh, version? So we would like to have something like this, but removing uh, the, the assumption of permutation invariance. Uh, so this is the, the result. Uh, so, uh, so imagine that we have uh, some graph, whatever you want. It's regular, so it's irregular. The degree is t. Uh, and number of vertices n. And now let rho be a n qubit state, OK? n states you're given. Uh, then uh, the result is that there exists some globally separable states. I'll tell you what they are, such that this condition is satisfied. So first, a globally separable state is just a uh, state that can be written in this form. So it's a convex combination. PK is a probability distribution. And here are product states, so local states. Okay? So this is a fully separable state. There is no entanglement there. right? You can prepare the state just with like shared randomness. And what the result says is that, of course, if you take uh, arbitrary state pro, it might be very different globally from a separable state, right? What the uh, result says is that if you just look at local tests, then, uh, then they start looking more alike. So what they say is that you take expectation value. So on the average, you look at the vertices on, on the graph. So here's the graph. Here are the vertices. You look at one of these vertices like this. 
And then you look at the reduced states here between qubits i and j. So it's rho i and j. Versus the same for these separable states, sigma i and j. And we have an error term. Okay? So when the degree is big, right, this is the local dimension, d. Uh, for example, it's, if it's qubits, it's 2. And this is the degree. So this shows that when the degree is, is high of the graph, this starts to get small, and this is a good approximation. Right? So why, why this, this is a manifestation of entangled monogamy? Well, because uh, the degree is the number of neighbors that we care about in the approximation. Right? So we only, the states might be very different from each other. But all, all we care is that these two reduced density matrix are close, these two and these two, and so on. So when the degree is high, means that we care that uh, for these qubits, uh, the, the separable state should take care of the correlations of this guy with this one, this one, and this one, and, and the degree higher more and more, right? And because uh, each, each quantum system cannot be highly entangled with many others, this approximation gets better. OK? Yes. Oh, yeah. Good. Oh, yes. But I, I also give some examples, maybe it'll be clear. But it's just that um, imagine that each guy has a lot of neighbors. All that we care about is the correlations of, of this guy on average with the neighbors. And because entangled monogamy, this guy cannot be highly entangled with all of its neighbors. So the, the, the separable states will do a good job. So let's see some examples, OK? So one example is we can call local entangled. Oh, yes. So this has nothing to do with Hamiltonians whatsoever. No. Have, yes. So it just says it's about quantum states, yes. About quantum states. That's right. Yes. We will see how to connect to this Hamiltonians just in a few slides, but yeah, the general thing is about quantum states. Uh, OK, so. What's so, little d again? Sorry? What's little d here again? It, it's the local dimension okay, of the particles. <coughs> uh, all right, so let, let's see this example I call like local entanglement. Imagine that some, some of the particles are highly entangled in an EPR state, in a maximally entangled state, and the rest is whatever they can be to satisfy mm -hmm. it. There is a quantum state, and let's see what happens, right? So when we have a, a red edge, Let's say that there's an EPR pair. So there's an EPR pair here, there's an EPR pair here, and so on, right here, and so on. Uh, but if there's an EPR pair here, well, what we saw before, all the other particles, they have to be in a product state with these two, right? So what happens? When IJ, our edge, is red, then because this is an EPR pair, and this has to be separable, the error is very big. Okay, You can upper bound by one quarter. It's a constant. So it's pretty bad when you have an EPR pair. But for all the other ones, by entangled monogamy, they have to be in a product state, right? So here we have an EPR pair, uh, but this means that this has to be in a product state, this guy, and this has to be in a product state, right? So if you just do as our fully separable state, uh, tensor product of the reduced states, of the uh, one body reduced states of rho, you see that we only pay an error from the EPR pairs. But uh, we can only have one EPR pair per, uh, per particle, right? So if this particle has a lot of neighbors, if the degree is high, this approximation gets better and better, right? So if you localize the entanglement, it's fine because you only care about the correlations on average in each particle. How about we have some global entanglement, right? So one example, we take phi, the global states, from the Ha measure, OK? This is extremely entanglement in any way you want to look at. So it has a lot of entanglement. For example, for every region x, which is like half the, half the, less than half the total number of particles, the entropy, which is a measure of entanglement for these pure states, is close to maximum. OK, so, so maybe this is a problem, but, but it's not really. Because, because this entanglement is so global, if you look local, locally, which is what we care, the state rho ij, you can do the calculation. You see it's very close to the maximally mixed states. Okay? So again, just putting maximum mixed state everywhere achieves here for, for high random states. Right? So the fact that the entanglement is global means that you cannot access it locally. Just look at 2 by reduced density matrix. And then you don't care about it. So the final example, uh, this cat state as well, right? So these two examples before we saw just putting a product state, sigma as a product state does the job. In general, that's not true. But we can, uh, but put a separable state works, right? So these I already show. A cat state, the reduced states, they are the, this, uh, this classically correlated states. The fully separable state would just be this guy, right? And you can just check that all the reductions are, are right, OK? Um, all right. So, so what's the corollary? How we connect to Hamiltonians, right? It's very simple. So, so this is the corollary you can get if you have a d regular graph with n variables of this form. These are like projectors. Then there exists a, a 
product states, such that, right, this is like the mean energy, right? So it's energy divided by the number of, of uh, by m, right, by the number of local constraints. You can prove this is smaller than the unsat of h <coughs> plus this error term, okay? So one thing that this does is that uh, if I, of course, this phi is a product state, right? So it's a classical witness. You can write it efficiently and you can compute this term efficiently, right? So what this shows is that the problem is an NP if for this kind of error. The error is like local dimension square over degree, roughly. So this puts the limitations on the parameters that quantum PCP can be true, right? Uh, so, okay. Now what's interesting is that in this regime, the problem is not that uh, the problem becomes like uh, in polyno uh, polynomially solvable, okay? So the problem is still NP hat. You can prove that for this kind of parameters, the problem is still NP hat. But it's not QMA hat, right? So, so there's this range of parameters for which classical PCP is true. Uh, the problem is NP hat, but quantum, if, they can't, if it's true at all, it's not. Um, all right. So, okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so let, let me just explain how this, it's very simple, right? So let me just explain uh, how the reduction works. Uh, just. This is good to, uh, to see it one more time. So, so suppose we have this row is the optimal assignment for the constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, so, so it's the state of minimum energy for this Hamiltonian. By the theorem, we know that there is this fully separable state for which all the two by reduced density matrix, they are right up to this zero, right? This is the theorem that I just showed. Now let's compare these two energies. One is this energy, it's trace sigma h <coughs> for sigma the fully separable state divided by this normalization factor. And the other one is with rho. And by definition, this is just the unsat value, right? Now, we know this h is a sum of local terms. So we can just write this as expectation over this, right, this local constraints of sigma minus rho. And trace norm is like variation distance for quantum states. We have this equality, inequality, okay? So that's pretty standard. And this is exactly what, what we know, right, from this theorem. So we know this is smaller than this term. Uh, this, is our, this is the value of our ansatz, is the energy of our, of our ansatz, which is this fully separable state. This is smaller than the true ansatz plus this small error term, okay? So, uh, so, yeah, so we have this statement about quantum states and as an application we get this result on Hamiltonians. Now, just to end, why, why this first thing I show you is true? Now, it's, it's pretty easy, right? So, let's just take a look at a case where t squared log t divided by degree is smaller than half, okay? We can always make sure this is the case by adding some, some dummy edges and decreasing the unsat a little bit by a constant amount, and then we make sure we are here. Then we run this procedure, assuming it exists, and then we know, and then we use the theorem, right? So the theorem says this, that for the new Hamiltonian, HT, this one, amplified one, this is true. But now we know the local dimension grows exponentially, Right, so this is like d to the power of t. We know the degree grows exponentially. This is d to the power of t. So we have this term, okay? Now, if this is more than one, this decreases exponentially. All right, so this becomes better and better. Um, so, um, right, so this is how, uh, how you show it. All right, so I was going to be some outline of the proof, but I, I'll just jump, I'm out of time. So let me just summarize. Uh, so, so the main, main point of the talk was to show that uh, this, this phenomenon of entanglement monogamy puts limitations both on, on quantum PCPs, on which parameters quantum PCP might be true, and also on approaches for proving them, right? So it shows that we have to really uh, look at genuinely quantum ideas to, to prove a quantum PCP if it's true. And there are many open questions. So the first, uh, uh, more technical one, but I think it's very nice, is that the frontier of what we know about quantum PCP is to try to combine these results that are, that are presented with the result by uh, Doritz and, and Liu that I just mentioned. And what this combination will be is, is to ask whether we can find an approximation in NP of highly expanding, so like very small, or even highly small set expanding, no commuting key local models. Okay, so we got something for two local models uh, on general graph, on general Hamiltonians. Uh, these guys got something for k local, but only for commuting. <laughs> it's nice to combine them. We don't know how to do that. 
and really both techniques uh, fail there. So first, our product state approximations probably is not enough to achieve that, so we have to go beyond these product states. And the technique they use, which is based on this Bravi Villai <coughs> idea that I didn't explain, also fails because this only works for computing models. So it's, it, it would be nice to find some common ground there. So can we relate this quantum blowing up maps to, to quantum games? Right? Maybe that's a way of showing that they exist and disprove the conjecture. I have no idea. It seems hard. So what Daniel talked so about, can we improve these clock constructions to improve the gap? Maybe it's possible. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, it's exactly this that you ask, right? So, so classically, this quantum blowing up, uh, blowing up maps, you can relate them to, <coughs> to this uh, interactive to-prove system, right? So from, from a protocol for a uh, to-prove interactive system, you can construct this map, OK? Quantum, we don't know that, right? But it's not the same question as connecting the quantum PCP to those to-provers. No, okay. so okay. no, because this, this question will be the question you asked would be maybe in the direction of proving the quantum PCP is true, right? This would be proving that it's not true, right? Because if we can construct the quantum blowing up map, then the conjecture is not true, quantum PCP. Yeah, I, I think that the question is, is it related to getting an equivalent statement of quantum PCP in terms of games? Uh, the question, right, right. But this is a different question, right? This is just about, uh, we, I define this notion of quantum blowing up map if you look at the, uh, the classical notion, this is the same as parallel repetition for, for classical games, yeah. but this does not appear to be the same as parallel repetition for quantum games. So the question is whether you can connect the two. And there's yet another connection that we don't know, which is between quantum PCP and games. That's right, yes. A different connection is exact. Yeah. Whether like MIP with entanglement has some connection to quantum PCP. That's right. <coughs> Sorry, can I? Yes. Go back to the previous point about so so this, this? was specific to uh, to just two local. What, what Everything I showed was for two local. Yes. And, and what, what happens if you try to use gadgets to go from three to two and so on? That does enough. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, it's a good question. So um, there is we try to do that. Okay. We don't have a proof that doesn't work, but it doesn't appear to work. Uh, yeah, no, right. So what, what happens is that these gadgets, uh, once you put them, you have all these new uh, like qubits that you introduce, and the degree for many of them is very low. Okay, and we have a version for average degree, <coughs> but this note for average degree that we have is not really average degree. It's like you know, uh, the average of one over degree stuff like this doesn't doesn't work. And and I think there is a good reason because this. Um, this uh, perturbation theory tricks, you can show that in, you can see that in many cases the state has a lot of entanglement. Okay, it's not just product states, and we're really just throwing away all the all the, all the entanglement. So I think there is some reason why it's not working, more fundamental reasons, but it's not completely out yet. I think. So, okay, well, everything was about product states. They are nice, but it seems to come up with examples where they will not work very well. There is a whole f like. Uh, theory of trying to expand these product states to more complicated states, like this tensor network states. It would be nice to see if we can understand them better, right? the power of these tensor network states. And of course, to prove of this proof quantum PCP, it would be the final thing. So thank you. For Yeah, not, not that I know. Oh, I mean, only, OK, so I can show you this. But we have this cost, this uh, cost grain version, right, where you, you have the graph. You cost grain into, into like regions, the balls here are regions. And now you understand how well big, pro, uh, big product state do the job. So like there is a, any state here, any state here, and so on. And then you can you get improved things, like in terms of expansion, and in terms of average entanglement. So that's the, the only thing that I know. In terms of more interesting, like tensor network states, like constant depth applied to product states, I don't know anything. But yeah, it would be nice to know. Yes? Along the same line, 
Is there a, a particular reason why you don't expect the fuel with the RM to be extendable to uh, K particle states? So you can extend it to K particle states, but then you don't get this in terms of the degree only. So you will get, uh, so for example, if you have a complete graph, okay, then the result works for, uh, where is this result? So if you have a complete graph, so like this of other n, then this works for up to, I think, square root n subsystems here. But you only get this in terms of degree if, uh, if it's for two-body reduced density matrix. So, yep. Um, Can you just go back? No. Yeah. Go I just wanted to ask you to go back to the, to the proof of your <coughs> main state. So you have already proven this combinatorial statement about quantum states. And so can you go back to the main proof of the main theorem, like? Of, of this guy? Of that guy. Uh -huh. So how does? Oh, OK, how it, it comes so, together. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. What All right. Come together? Yes, OK, good. So uh, OK, so suppose we have this mapping. And now let's look at this Hamiltonian HT, OK? So now let's apply this uh, combinatorial thing for quantum states to HT. So this is what it gives, right? The corollary reaction that you can, have, you can find a product state. This phi is a product state, right? For which the energy is smaller than unsat plus a small error term. And the error term is like local dimension for, for the t uh, version divided by degree. Now, these guys, by the assumption we know this is exponential in t, and this is exponential in t as well. So we have this, right? So we have an exponent in t here now. But by just putting some dummy edges, you can always make sure that this is true, right? This is more than half. So this is more than one here. So this goes to 0. Exponentially in T, right? So you just choose T and off, and you have here as small error as you want, right? But then this becomes a bit true because you can decide, right, the, the original one, right? If you can you can estimate the mean energy of this to any accuracy you want, and therefore also solve the original problem, right? Because if it was satisfiable, it's still satisfiable. If it was not, at some point you see that the energy cannot be that small. Thank you again. Thanks.